Good afternoon, everyone, and happy first day of October. Uh, my name is Katie Schramm. I am the Lunch Poems Coordinator for the 2015-2016 season. I'd like to thank you all for being here today. First off, we have our emailing list, so if you're not on our list, it's right over on the librarian's desk, and I recommend that you add your name to it. Um, we also have, po um, we have posters over there with the complete lunch poems um, program, so be sure to pick one up. Um, if you are interested in seeing this reading or past readings, you can check out our website, which is lunchpoems.berkeley.edu. Um, next month, uh, we will be featuring a reading by Toy Derricott on November 5th, uh, so please come back and join us then. Um, and if you're feeling a little more prosy, uh, you can check out our sister program, Story Hour, on October 8th, which is next Thursday um, at 5 p.m., and that's featuring novelist Nang, um, Yang Huang. Now, uh, please welcome Robert Haas, director of Lunch Poems, who will introduce John Shopta. Thank you, Katie, and welcome to everyone. A special welcome to the students from Maybeck High, that terrific school, who are here today, two classes. I uh, went to school with one of the founders of your school, Stan Cardenet. I don't know if he's still teaching there, but I think he founded Maybeck. And I met him when he was a sophomore and I was a freshman, and he asked me if I knew Wagner's music, and I said no. And he said, oh, I pity you. That was my <laughs> introduction to him. Uh, special reading today by my English department colleague, John Shapta. John grew up on a bend of the Mississippi River in Missouri, um, where he worked in a mill, picked cotton. There were three things on the, and picked cotton. Anyway, he went from, he, he went from a, a little part of the Midwest that was like the southern part of the South that was still feeling the effects of the Depression in the 1950s. So that writing about it now, having, John having left that world, gone to Harvard, written a critical book about John Ashbery, written a libretto for an opera about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, has been working on the book of poems that became Times Beach, which was published this year and won the Notre Dame Prize uh, for a first book of poems. Um, it's available for sale here. Trying to say something about it, I was thinking that it's a bit about as if you had a cross between James Agee's Let Us Now Praise Famous Men and Hart Crane's The Bridge. That is, it's, it's a book of challenging material. It's about the history of the Mississippi River. It's about the people and the language and the critters of the place. He's tried to write a poetry infused with um, American history and with the environmental history of places. It's not where poetry has been going in the last few years toward uh, subject matter of this kind. And that's very striking. And he does it. I don't think you'll probably pick this up very directly reading it in incredibly inventive literary forms. That is, it's a world passed through these um, sometimes very sophisticated uh, forms. For example, telling the story of the great flood on the Mississippi in the stanza of Spencer's The Fairy Queen though probably here reading it, you won't hear it. And also mixing the dialects of the places that he's from. And the, the tongue, rivers breed dialects. They, the people upriver speak differently than the people downriver. And you'll hear those inflections. It's an extremely rich and ambitious uh, book of poems. And I'm really happy to introduce him, congratulate him on the Notre Dame Prize, and um, ask him to share his poems with us today. So thank you, John. Thank you, Bob, so much. And uh, let me just say, I know you have to run, but time speech uh, would not be time speech without the attention that you've lavished on its pages over the years. So thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, begin uh, my walk through the book with uh, a sequence uh, of uh, poems. The first sequence called Blues Haiku, it's a hybrid form. And I hope just through my reading aloud, you'll 
you'll, you'll hear why uh, these go together. I want to blur from a Tupelo stump like a crawfish in an endangered swamp. A purple blur from a Tupelo stump. Then that crawfish pinching moss off a cypress knee, so standoffish. Ground fog swirling, smelling fresh as death when the wind disturbs it. Ground fog swelling, ammonia smell, fresh as death. Somebody mopping the kitchen or baking meth. <laughs> what moving violation, unpaid citation, peccadillo, drove you, bandito, from what amarillo, what crime against nature, peccadillo, so far to the north, oh, nine-banded tire tread, armadillo. The pileated drummer's walk it was unignorable that that was my song. The drummer's low walk, 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 it was unignorable, and not the sweet, sweet, sweet prothonotary's warble. I might just walk barefoot down to that moody Mississippi, like a sadhu to the Ganges, might work my feet into the mud of that mighty Mississippi, in the name of no power in the mud, but the muddy Mississippis. This one I wrote after the BP oil explosion in the Gulf. The towpath to the deep south, it don't feel too well, and it makes me woozy. Towpath to the river mouth, no, it don't feel too well. Laid up with a laughing gull and a brown pelican shell. Upon a mounded sand boil stared the witness tree since before the quake. On the sand boil glared the red oak hanging tree till a mercy bolt cut it down out of its misery. Down an imitative river road in the warbler inflected breeze. Anything else? The old channel's tree line in the warbler inflected breeze. Lemon, 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 catfish and hush puppies. I, uh, was, uh, and maybe this was the third thing uh, that uh, Robert Hass was uh, thinking of. I was, seems strange to say it now, I was baptized uh, in a drainage ditch. Uh, <laughs> in southeast Missouri, a ditch called Wahite, uh, named for a man W.A. Height, but somehow the, the periods got a little faded and we all thought it was Wahite uh, by, by my time. Uh, so I want to read a few from uh, this poem to try to describe the drainage and the ditch and the baptism. Uh, this is called girdled, which is something you do to a tree uh, to kill it. The dark cypress swamp giving way to the Swampland Act of 1850, sinking to rise no more. Slatches and sand ridges quaking still is superseded by the Little River Drainage District, a system of channels, tacks, and concrete setback levees, water detention basins for catching malarial night airs the few stubborn beaver dams which staunched the runoff, once they're dynamited clear, a rich black loam is reclaimed, unfurrowed, sown in swamp chestnut oak and sweet gum stumps, cut over bald cypresses, drowned bone white, or coming back up brown need, lost without their deep understory, the resurrection fern, stumps thick as dragon's teeth, Pumpkin ash, burr oak, shell bark hickory, possum haw, slippery elm, a 130 foot persimmon stump, 
having stumped the dragline crawlers, walking draglines, steam-powered stump pullers, where migratory snake birds fly over and cotton mouths yawn, stumps that one dark morning get on up and take their places back of a hickory plow to plow or a hoe to chop. Should mention uh, why I got baptized. Uh, I was crazy in love uh, with my first girlfriend, and I think I would have done pretty near anything. Uh, but I like the church, I like the music. Um, she lived in a Delmo, what was called a Delmo labor home. And uh, uh, this story, uh, and her family was uh, sharecroppers, uh, and that's where I spent a lot of my, uh, my time. Uh, this poem on Jordan's Stormy Banks tells the story of that, uh, how the uh, labor homes came about. Uh, I think of it as a, as a docu-poem, a documentary poem. Got an epigraph from a sharecropper poet. Uh, it's actually a song. Landless, landless are we, just as landless as landless can be on Jordan's stormy banks. Cook smoke after cook smoke, cornbread and fatback all along the roadside, coffee. We're Federal Route 60, out from Cairo, just past the turn of 1939, crosses 61 Highway up from Memphis. A hundred miles of gray smoke pillars mushrooming overnight. Scarcely a car, wagon, or truck in sight. Had they picked themselves in a bulging cloud sack to be weighed at the plowed under margins? Croppers who'd flooded the Missouri boot heel, the bow weevil, the night rider behind them, tenanted with furnish, the landlord to provide them fertilizer, seed, and work stock, tar paper cabin, markup, and interest. Come the New Deal, paid not to plant, the Rarenback tells his croppers, get their parity shares in his hip pocket. But they'd convert that eviction into an exodus. Households heaped mile upon mile on the frozen road bank, interiors laid bare. For one wall, a dresser, partially handled, bareheaded or capped with a mirror. A corn shuck mattress doubled over, a box spring, coop, or a bed grill for another. Bed sheets and gray striped tablecloths knotted into swollen bundles. Thunder. Frozen rain reborn as weightless snow. Roofed with an oilcloth, blanket, or quilt, or an upended table. Out front, the cook stove, an oil drum converted, on which a black girl, hair scarfed, and what looks to be a pajama top, follows or traces a design with her finger. One stout white toddler, bare-legged in January, picks me out from the lingering onlookers at Arthur Rothstein's photographs. So does the black girl's older brother. What can we do for you? Three black croppers in overalls and fedoras engage me directly through their picture. But a young white couple, braced for their day, can't afford me much attention. The cropper who showed them the way to sit right tight was long in coming. 1936, oven dry, summer dark, Mr. Drinkwater's plantation, Brother Whitfield parched plows on, from cane to kinked, day sight to night blind, coaxing his half-tone mule. Come on, boy, to that unpicked cotton bush, moonbone white. From out of the dark, his boy's fair voice, no bread, no ham hock, no milk, no molasses, neither. Whitfield pounds his knees into the furrow, offers up fist full of dust. Moonlight ignites the cotton bush. All my life, I go by your book, the Lord to reward his servants. The good bush blazes back. I give you crops to fill your barns, but you let somebody lock them away leave you the bone without the wish. Brother Whitfield dusts off his soul, comes to his feet, a southern tenant farmer's union man. And Moses gets him to the Red Sea, 
and they make camp there. But here come old boss pharaohs riding bosses in their chariots. It's history repeating itself in 1939. Not to be lynched, Brother Whitfield waits out of harm's way while croppers sing. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye. Jesus is my captain. I shall not be moved. Plagued with exploding flashbulbs, the landlords await the Red Cross, who tells them they'll send no aid that might muddy the waters of the Missouri state. Suffering from this self-imposed health menace, this unprecedented traffic hazard, heartened, the Rarenbacks dump these unsightly subjects out of focus into the spillway. Mississippi bottomland between two levees those same croppers had raised. Homeless junction, land of ice ditch water to drink, nothing to eat, no one to see. Too late, the post is dispatched. The herald sounds, the march of time, too reeled, tramps into movie houses. Eleanor writes them into her column. Franklin sees it wasn't good. Let's there be 10 Del Mo labor villages, homes turned into segregated circles, water running hot and cold, electrical power, storage and garden, whatever it was they missed, poverty, grinding between gears like a newfangled tractor, as promised. I brought those photographs with me, by the way, if you want to see them later at the table. Um, this is my baptism poem. Uh, it's called Castor Glands. Uh, Wahite Ditch straightened Castor River and Castor... Uh, some of you may know means beaver. Brother Pascal, feet planted in wall height, where bright angel feet have trod, with the authority given to him from Delmo Baptist Church by Jesus Christ, tilting John back with one hand under his backbone into the water, pinching the other over his mouth and nose, John musing on Sherry Kay's pudenda, how else to explain what I see next? Watches as a veering brown current, sleek and nippy as any from Castor River, firms and fattens into a yearling beaver that dips and swirls up before John's face and shows its incisors, enraptured it seems to have found him or caught him as Castor at last, his bollocks, I mean Pollux, before it dives over, that is, under John's startled head, making as if to bite off his shrunken scrotum for its sharp and leathery perfumed castorium. John, groping for the belt loops of his dress pants, had he worn them, when up bobs the singing embankment, Brother Pascal grinning at him, you're saved. <laughs> and it happened just like that. This, this is my, uh, my resurrection poem. It's called Twice. And uh, remembering Douglas Lionel Hammock Sr. in this poem. What makes me think there's anything here anymore. I could raise up writhing out of this drowned river. I might as well try catching two fish off the same worm. Big Lionel swears you can. He's living with cancer now in an assisted living facility where he's begun now and then to recollect the same thing twice. He used to get the horse weeds around the side of the road, and he'd stop and find the weeds with the knots in them, slice off seven-inch sticks, and throw them in the bottom of the boat, and that'd be his bait. He'd split a stick end to end, and the little horse weed would be laying there feeding on the marrow of the wood. He'd take the worm out, put it on a small hook, He'd have a split shot sinker and a small floater, and he'd put it out on a long about a 14 foot pole and 14 foot of line on it, and he'd just dabble it around bald cypress logs and down into hollow stumps, alive with fish and likely spots, 
Pedipteus might be, and when they hit it, he'd just jerk a little and he'd get his fish caught, which he caught a lot of bluegill, mostly bluegill, but also goggle eye, red ear, which is also called a shell cracker. It feeds on snails on the bottom of the creek and a crappie now and then, and he'd catch a bass occasionally, and occasionally he'd catch a catfish, though he'd be fishing for bluegill, like he says, with about a 14-foot pole, and he had about 14 foot of line on it, where he could toss it out round to likely spots where a fish might be, and when they hit it, his little floater'd go under and he jerk and catch his fish. Now, a cricket is soft, and by the time a fish catches that, he actually grabs it in his mouth and he tears it up. But a horseweed is tough, and he stays on, and you can catch half a dozen fish sometime, and the fish should still be hitting at this brown and yellow skin hanging on the hook, which he caught a lot of bluegill. And in the name of Castor River, Little River Drainage District, Wall Height Drainage Ditch, and in the name block lettered on the Long Gone Railroad Station's Long Gone Sign, W.A. Height, I put out this poem on about a four to five foot line, and in the name of John, I dabble it about bald cypress stumps and likely spots, and I keep my keyboard running and my eye upon the floater. Yeah. I think. Um, moving into part two, the 19th century age of exploration. One of the ways people first saw the Mississippi was through something called a panorama, which was a very popular uh, precursor to the, uh, to the movie house. Long stretches of canvas reeled and unreeled on upright rollers. Uh, no one was more popular than John Banvard, who uh, sketched the Mississippi and then drew a 300-foot painting uh, of the river. Uh, something of a self-parody in this poem. Uh, Banvard's three-mile moving Mississippi panorama will, thanks to a pair of bevel-geared cranks and a row of suspended pulleys, unreeling the mighty canvas from one upright roller onto another, transport you, seated hands on knees before the darkened proscenium, to its waking dream of pecan trees festooned with the muscadine vine, where along the way you will be ambushed off Plum Point by Merle's River pirates, astonished by slaves cross-sectioning an aboriginal burial mound, amazed by such effects done up brown in the dioramic line as the New Madrid quake liquidating its banks, a gaslit moon paddling the rumpled canvas with argent brush strokes, the Crescent City's carnival flambeaux succumbing to ashes. This most mammoth pictorial voyage, praised alike by the poet of Evangeline and the author of Household Words, carrying Windsor Castle's distinguished mark of royal approbation, will cover in under two hours 1,200 miles of river with 700 gallons of paint, casting certain foreign writers who scoff that America has no art commensurate with its size, face down into consternation. This evening's river, narrated by none other than that sketcher of the lonesome skiff, John Banvard, his poetry and patter diversified by Madame Chuiso on her piano fort, will commence once the night swells, unfasten his flat boat from Mastodon Bone Bar, upon which it has unaccountably snagged, as your captain and artist, Mr. Banvard, serenely and hourly expects they will. Um, just a little stretch from uh, a poem called Itasca. Itasca, some of you may know, is the, uh, the source 
of the uh, Mississippi River. Um, it was uh, discovered, quote unquote, by a man named Schoolcraft, uh, guided there by the Ojibwe, who lived there and knew the source uh, well. Ojibwe's wife, uh, sorry, Schoolcraft's Ojibwe wife uh, translated Ojibwe folk tales that Longfellow used for Hiawatha. And I used the Hiawatha form accordingly for this poem, which itself is taken from the Finnish uh, cycle of the Kalevala, uh, paraphrastic repeating half lines. Uh, this little stretch takes place on an island in the middle of Lake Itasca, now still called Schoolcraft Island. Then a stunning flash of powder, thunderclap, anachronistic, brought a figure there before them, visionary bird it looked like, weird, five-legged fowl with box head, light-proof box head, one-eyed, black cloaked, both a non-existent creature and an intricate contraption crafted by old Mudjikiwis, made of sliding, folding rosewood, plagiarized from Charles Dodgson, borrowed unbeknownst to Carol. In its case, it lay compactly folded into nearly nothing, sewn up with the fur side inside, cranked out with the skin side outside. Then it opened out its hinges, pushed and pulled its joints and hinges, till it looked all squares and oblongs, conical, collapsing bellows from a complicated figure from the second book of Euclid. Next, from out its sable plumage, stupefying all who saw it, there appeared a hand, its fingers fluent with symphonic gesture. Won't you move a wee bit closer, quoth the box bird. There, I've got you. And this is accompanied with a not terribly sympathetic uh, marginal note from the scoliast. It seems the poet discovered at an irreversible state of composition that the camera was only invented some decades subsequently. Uh, hence, the unlikely modifier anachronistic. Lewis Carroll, a photography enthusiast who used a camera lo loaded on a tripod, composed a poem in emulation of Hiawatha, Hiawatha photographing from which our flagging poet has taken a few lines. The box bird perhaps symbolizes the Almighty's all-seeing eye. Only the poet, if even he, now knows. Having a scoliast is like having your cake and eating it, too. You can make fun of your poem as well as uh, write it, which is great. So uh, a few poems now from a sequence called Shuffle, in which various narratives are shuffled. I was uh, raised uh, in New Madrid County, as we called it, the epicenter of the New Madrid earthquake, which uh, rang church bells in Boston, brought uh, people out of their apartments in New York City, woke uh, Thomas Jefferson in uh, Monticello. Uh, it was, it was the biggest quake we know of, uh, this 1811, 1812. Uh, there were various precursors and uh, you know, signs and wonders uh, betokening the quake. Uh, the most dramatic was uh, a great migration of 10,000 or more squirrels out of the Illinois woods south, as one uh, traveler put it. No obstacles seemed to check this extraordinary and concerted movement. The word had been given them to go forth and they obeyed it, though multitudes perished in the broad Ohio, which lay in their path. This is called ghost squirrels. Not out of the woods, not even now. We have yet to arrive at our theory of commotion. What mad word came over us, some now think? What hounded us out of tree was a whiff of radon, or else a not well anticipated emission of rotten egg. Some of us sensed an undertone, a locomotive tingling way down in our amygdala, which roused us indignant from our lifelike sleep. But such explanations, we feel, only further our bleak bewilderment. What it was, was 
an unaccountable flurry of shadow tail, a barely readable dictation of innumerable plumes we'd squirreled away ages ago like a report card without opening. Trees intertangled, shadows malformed disagreeably. We cast ourself a significant look as though we knew something we didn't. We hoarded mast, chattered and chuckled, allegroomed and mated much as before, but a cold drizzle of coincidences stopped us altogether. As though we just realized what we'd been up to. Tail a quiver, we poured down trunk and flooded the forest floor. An ordeal, to be sure, but also an oddly moving experience. Deer, even bear, fled our fuzzy determination. Navigating by stars or by each other, it was better together. Needy, distrustful, we were what we could never rightly recollect. The river changed us unrecognizably, though we go on like nothing happened. Among those uh, caught in the, uh, the quake were the, uh, the Lewis brothers, uh, nephews of Thomas Jefferson, who had moved with Jefferson's sister to uh, Kentucky, uh, not far from the uh, epicenter. And uh, one of their uh, errand boys, they owned a young teenager uh, by the name of George, who, among other things, carried spring water from a rocky hill in the ancestral uh, Wedgwood pitcher uh, from the Jefferson family. It was the, it was the main keepsake uh, they had. This is called Keeper. George, who'd brought home Mother Jefferson's potsherd, walked with Lilburn, a great deal agitated toward, toward the kitchen cabin. There was meat to be cured. Then and there, feloniously, with a certain ax held in both his hands, Nero licking and licking his paws, valued at two dollars, Lilburn Lewis, farmer, did happen with Isham Lewis, yeoman, his brother, to strike, cut, and penetrate in willfully upon the neck bone of said property, George, his brother. Lilburn then did cast into the hearth the leg bones disconnected from the ankle bones to fill in the fault. Gorged on blood, the earth retching heaved. Tossed on her hardwood bed, Letitia labored to plug her nostrils, and on a swaying alcove bed in Monticello, oddly not disconnected, dear Uncle Jefferson groped in his sleep for Sally his when the red and gray rocks caved in on George dismembered. Whereupon the brothers indicated to their remaining property that they should rebuild the fireplace and mortar said members evenly among the hearthstones. Then the earth commenced to fart from its hindquarters out through the chimney. Mephitic brimstone and steam bellowed from behind the back of Wilburn, who jerked his head, muttered coincidence, and kicked out at the hearth. Still wet and muddy, the chimney mound collapsed afresh. Startled, Nero broke for the cane break, then slunk back. And this is the quake. It's called every creeping thing. In the end, the stars and the moon took on the dark and sank into blackness. Not pure blackness, but a thick sulfurous vapor, stinking and dull discharged from the nasal cavities and mouths of the earth, put an end to the moon and the stars. Currents of electrical fluid, maybe, branching like ganglia under the ground, so in darkness subterranean thunder delivered hard shocks to the earth, rippling in spasms like the dumb flesh of beef just killed, swelling into land waves that bursting through dead-looking carbonized matter and rotten water up into the heavens. Word that the river was cut in twain coincided with tales of a sudden huge wave, the Mississippi flinging itself backwards, perhaps toward a lesser chaos, depopulating flatboats, their coffee still steaming, 
leaving canoes their blankets and maize, swallowing trees by the thousands and resurrecting decomposed trunks which jolted upright to bob with the dead and the living. Wholly unprepared for such confusion, the humans converted into crawling things, sinners into saints on hands and knees, trembled around campfires and flung prayers upwards in Spanish and Osage, cast up West African, French, and English, or giddily babbled. The one congregated, even though prostrate, was heard to mutter of a low-down trick, the day of judgment come in the night. Cattle, confounded, left calves just fold and mingled among the humans, load or keeled right over. Fowl swarming, their trees decked or torn apart from the roots up, deserted the shrieking woods and took to the shoulders and heads of those who'd fled their dwellings. One red flanneled old couple, still holed up at home, looked out into their garden on bears and panthers, foxes and wolves, rocking together with deer and rabbits, goats and sheep. Their tongues hanging, the creatures peered at the couple as though wondering, would they let them on board? Would they let there be any more of what they called day? So, uh, one of my favorite uh, creatures is the uh, crawfish, uh, partly because they build these wonderful towers of, uh, out of pellets that they round in their little hands and mouth parts um, from underground pouches where they get the soil. This is called uh, crawfish castle. Mounding mud ball by mud ball, a stately totter for no reason the likes of us can know, whether for defensive purposes, the mounder never having to leave its burrow, or to enhance the pouch's oxygenation, the pouch being sunk below the river table, or for some esoteric ritual of appeasement maybe, such as was practiced atop Monk's Mound at Cahokia, and in the 11th chapter of Genesis, the towering fable against making a name for oneself erected in the midst of the tribal genealogies of Shem, a name meaning name, the fable become apotropaic, which may be why crawfish chimneys are as widely scattered as bewilderingly singular, from the frankly phallic to the alluvially deltic studded with odd-sized pellets as a fertility goddess's statue with breast, or a crawfish in berry with crawfish, stroking its raspy belly with its swimmerets, as though these towers also were raised in a confusing babble, plagued with mutual incomprehension, aggressive disregard or distortion, each crawfish encoded anyhow with the itch for mounding. Its castle's mud clump rings roughened and yellowed inversely to the soil's strata, an upside down and inside out tunnel of Babel. Did that crawfish, no fish, its name an archaic mutation of crevice, more a spidery mud bug to us than a miniature lobster, having molded another sour clay marble with its pincers and its mouth parts having heaved it with its snout and heaved it up its murky and slickened throatway, its Sisyphean flaw, never to know when or how to call it quits, having shoved it into the last hole left in its glistening rim, did it look for a moment like a god, look as a god looks, fashioning its gaze as its eye stalks paced the horizon in the image of one or another of its predators, a raccoon or a painted turtle, an alligator or a grackle banking overhead, or a couple of little river boys who bike out one morning to fish a crawdad up out of its hole with a birch twig, which would no sooner appear than skedaddle rearwards, its fantail uropod scooping. Did it lord it over all alike? till something in it scurried it backwards, 
scooting it down from on high to kiss awake another globe, descending from its tower to mound another bewitching globe, and not dig its own crypt, glob by bloated glob? <coughs> a bit from a uh, dramatic poem called Heebie Jeebies, A Dream Mask. Um, <clears throat> This is a, uh, in the form of a Miltonic mask because uh, the oldest of the Mardi Gras crews, uh, Comus, takes its name from that mask. Uh, the people of Comus and the other old crews were often bankers, mostly, and they, uh, when the 1927 flood was barreling down towards New Orleans, uh, the one elected worked with the elected officials uh, and compelled them to dynamite the banks south of the uh, city, uh, displacing thousands, uh, but saving the city and, more importantly, its financial interest, which uh, the country was following. This is uh, the final stage, from the final stage direction of the dynamiting. The Lord of Misrule sets his smoking cup down on Poydras Levy and grips his fizzing wand in both hands. A collective gasp from the crowd and the solitary audience. Comus plants his sparking wand on the tangle of fuses. As the gong strike midnight ringing in Ash Wednesday, the blast makes what Dr. Pelican denominated an opening, through which gushes to the dreamer's astonishment, neither a Niagara nor even a Mississippi of river water, but a deluge of ash. The penitential incineration overwhelms the curiosity seekers and carnival goers, the dignitaries and members of the press, fixing them in various attitudes of terror, astonishment, and insouciance, as after a second Vesuvius, ash covers the stilted houses and old palmetto huts under the levee. It swamps St. Bernard, the Isle of Della Crows, and the vacated schoolhouse of Violet. It fills the mouths and tongues of alligators and of muskrats and slimes the shells of oysters, turtles, and crabs. It coats the wings of pelicans, gulls, skimmers, and parrots. It also flows stage right toppling the banners, glasscock and a chafalaya, and flows like lava downstage towards the banner gulf. The river around New Orleans lowers, but ash slides anyway over its semicircular levee, shattering the nerves of the contrite city. In gray papery strips, slender as 1929 vintage Wall Street ticker tape, it engulfs the bank of Momus, Dissolving its sugar and molasses facade, Comus scrapes up Momus's dank banking debris and uses it to buoy his own ponderous vault. No good. Papyrus scrolls, bankrupt. The bulging ash, having enveloped the stage, now spills over into the cavernous auditorium, gradually assuming the form of a great gray she-wolf which the horrified dreamer knows is Chase Bank, hungry for takeover. Sicking him on is a round-mouthed panic, hooved and horned as goatish Pan, who waves a banner in each hand, Lupercalia and Carne non vale, and yells with an unearthly reverberation, Sell! <laughs> Lurching, the dreamer finds himself fixed fast in his wing chair, naked except for a goatskin girdle, unable even to scream, emitting only the sick bellow of the boeuf gras. But the she-wolf, leaning her forepaws upon his icy chest, only smears the banker's contracted forehead with her ashen lick. And... Uh, the uh, book ends uh, rather definitively uh, with a poem called The Dead Zone, 
Uh, you may know that dead zones are oxygen depleted bodies of water, uh, such as the Gulf, especially in the summer, uh, that dead zone um, mainly uh, formed by the river crop of crops, that's corn. Corn futures surging, an international harvester swallows a hybrid field in a prolonged gulp. Hauled to New Madrid's Cargill elevator, by October, the load is floated in a barge fleet, clear down to the Gulf. Out through the Panama locks, the corn deep steamship docks at Qingdao, home to a beer and a dolphinarium. The non-GMO gets shipped from Buffalo Island to Rotterdam, the EU's port of entry, once it leaves the Gulf. Fresh from marsh gas reserves in Siberia or in Cotter, where young executives study golf, bags of ammonia fertilizer offloaded onto barges are hauled up river in a long tow, clear from the Gulf. Spun each spring from a fertilizer buggy, the urea the corn can't use runs off with the downpours to dissolve into otter slough, pouring into Little River, pouring into the San Francis, pouring into the Mississippi, on down to the Gulf. Nutrients mumbled from the river's swollen mouth get eaten by algae that bloom, then drop onto Louisiana's shelf, where they're eaten by bacteria sucking oxygen from still waters, leaving brittle stars, ghost shrimps, fiddler crabs, worms, gasping on the bottom of the Gulf. The future lies down river. It'll come about when the Mississippi signs its muddy hieroglyph. No moonlight special, and it's half past 12. Watch for pelicans. They know the way to the Gulf. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.